New Year, everyone. Happy New Year, Lori. Happy New Year. And I am Barrett. I'm interviewing Lori and Kissia today. It's January 3rd, 2022. Lori's our first interview of the year. Oh. Exciting. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's exciting for you to be here with me. Thank you. It's so good to see you. Uh, likewise. I look forward to it. Yes, me too. So, how long since we've seen each other? Oh, my goodness. Maybe 20 years? Oh, my since gosh. we had a conversation. I mean, well, Laura, our daughter, is 27. Oh, wow. So Amazing. Uh, so it's at least 27 years, probably. 27 years. <laughs> <laughs> a life-changing experience. Oh, um, yes. I can attest to that as well. Mm -hmm. And where were you born? I was born in um, Clark County, Nevada, in Henderson, Nevada, which is adjacent to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. When I was born, there was about a 13-mile road between the two, Las Vegas and Henderson. Now it's all one big megapolis. So what kind of work are you doing now? I'm a clinical social worker. Mm -hmm. um, I went back to school in 2010. Okay. I was what's called a non-traditional graduate student. I was the oldest student okay. in the whole cohort of two years. Got an MSW, got licensed. Now I, I'm working for an agency called Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles. Tell me about that. I saw that. Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles. I started out after I got out of school. I started out in community mental health, doing uh -huh. therapy. I was a mental health therapist. Worked with families, kids, adolescents, did a lot of field work. I really, really loved it, but I really wanted to work with people with substance use disorders. Hmm. And so um, a former uh, supervisor from community mental health had gone to this agency, Homeless Healthcare, and they had um, a job as a, as a team lead in their outpatient treatment program for substance use, actually dual diagnoses. So, she called me and said, hey, you're licensed now. Come over here. I want you to work for me. So I got <laughs> She knew a good she person was, when she saw it, right? She was my supervisor when I came uh -huh. out of school. It was really interesting for her and for me because I was her mother's age, and she was learning how to supervise somebody her mother's age. Mm -hmm. And we were we learned a lot from each other mm -hmm. that way. She, I was very honest with her. She was very honest with me. So we knew each other. So she said, come on over. So I've been there now six years. And I'm now working in the housing where is it located? Uh, we have several locations. It's very sort of branched out. We have our main headquarters is on Second Street in um, Los Angeles. In LA, uh -huh. we also have a large building um, on Beverly and Alvarado, um, and then there's another building down in Skid Row that I've worked in. But right now, I'm supervising um, a housing program that we're collaborating with with the County of LA. It's a diversion housing program. Mm -hmm. And so people, instead of being sentenced into jail or prison, they're being sentenced, they're being put on probation, sentenced into our housing program. Oh, is it co-ed? Yes. Wow. It's co-ed, and everybody in the program is very, very ill. Mm -hmm. Extremely ill. Some of the most challenging clients I've ever met mm -hmm. so far. And um, our job is to try to keep them in services, keep them in, you know, getting their health care, mental health care, Keep them housed, and it's it's an experiment. We're the first building that LA's trying. I was going to say, I haven't heard they're doing. I can hear a lot of different things, like changing parole dates, and right, know, right. obviously trying to change the system. Right. So they brought it's me expensive. in there. They it's extremely <laughs> I mean, expensive, yeah. um, but the, it's working. It's it's not as expensive as putting people in jail or right. prison, right, or psychiatric hospitals. So how many residents do you have then? I have, um, one of my buildings, I have 56, I wow. have um, 55 in another, I have 35 in another, and I have 17 in another, so those lot. are all my clients. Uh -huh. I'm supervising almost 125 people, clients, mm -hmm. and then um, seven staff. Not enough staff. It's not enough staff. <laughs> right. It's really not. Well, it's seven, it's seven case managers, and then I also supervise the, the LVNs, there's mm -hmm. two LVNs and a doctor. Mm -hmm. Who, I don't supervise him, but we collaborate. So, right. Yeah. So that's been. Is he a psychiatrist? He's a psychiatrist. That's good. Right. He's um he's a fellow at UCLA, so he's really good. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Wow. So do you like it? I do. It's been very rigorous. Yeah. I decided that um, I went back to social work school because um, I always wanted to be a social worker since I was a little kid. Um, How come? Because. Um, when I was 12, I met my best friend, Kathy, and Kathy and I met at church in the youth group, mm -hmm. and she had leukemia. So 
I used to travel with her every other week to the City of Hope, from Las Vegas to the City of Hope, so she would have treatment. She got mm -hmm. treatment there. Um, this was in 1970. And at that time, it was very experimental treatment. It was very brutal. Mm -hmm. And so she stayed overnight, and I stayed overnight with her mom and her sister in the family cottages on campus at City of Hope. And there was a social worker in the pediatrics oncology who would come in every day and she would bring music and art projects and she says, um, oh maybe I should do that. She was <laughs> so much she was the only she was like the breath of life that would come mm -hmm. in every day. Everybody was dying there. Mm -hmm. Like you would go home, you'd go to the cottage at night and not know if your mom was gonna be alive the next morning, yeah. right? Because it was really it was brutal. But the social worker was the person who was um, really life affirming, validating, and so I thought, you know, maybe when I grow up, I could do something like that. Uh -huh. um, and then life it's amazing how when we're young, we get impressed with things yeah. that stick with us. Mm -hmm. And the doctors and the nurses there were also really wonderful people, but I wasn't really attracted to the medical part of it because mm -hmm. there was in in the pediatric oncology, it was very. It really was, a, it was like the worst of the worst mm -hmm. medical stuff going on. And I just knew I couldn't handle that. But the yeah. social work part I, I wanted to do. Music, she did the family group. Music light groups, talking, right? Yeah, absolutely. I understand that. And there were other people that came to the City of Hope, celebrities, people that were musicians and actors and stuff. And the social worker would bring them to the pediatric garden. There was a garden downstairs for the kids. And so we had people like Cat Stevens, for example, mm -hmm. singing for us while we played. And That's great. I mean, it was just, it was phenomenal. But that was all the social worker. Uh -huh. um, so life took me one place or another and I didn't go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And I ended up working in music and theater. And How many people in your family, your biologic family? How many people? Oh, you have siblings? Or? Oh, I have a sister, my mm -hmm. sister Lita. She's um, three years younger than I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were both just really into music and theater, so that's kind of the route we took. That's why we came to L.A., actually. And um, so I did that for a long time and then eventually decided, no, I really want to do something a little deeper than this. And also we had my first partner and I had two kids, and um, I was away from them every night because of theater. I was mm -hmm. working in concert promotion, so I wouldn't get home until, like, midnight. And... So I wasn't seeing them enough, so we decided as a family to change that up. So I went, I started back to school, sort of, kind of, and then my partner got very, very sick, and that kind of took over our family dynamic. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that she she and I agreed on before she died was that I was going to go back to school. grad school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she really, she was like, she was very, very supportive. It was one of the last conversations that we actually had was, you're going to be a social worker now. She could tell you'd be good, right? Yeah. And she was a social worker, so mm -hmm. she said, you're going to take it over for me. You're going to do it for both of us. So that's what I did. Uh, what a nice gift. It was beautiful, yeah. Yeah, very nice. And she made it possible for me to do it, so I did. Uh-huh. Yeah. A good role model, too. She was. She worked in child welfare, which was something I was not interested in doing. <laughs> um, I wanted to work with people that were addicts. I mm -hmm. wanted to work with people who were doing drugs and alcohol and gambling and addicted to the internet and all that stuff. So. What interested you in that client population? My family experience. Uh -huh. um, in 2003 and 2005, both my uncle and my cousin both overdosed and died um, oh, wow. on opiates, opioids, um, that they were buying illegally. Um, and at that point, I thought, okay, this is... So you had a lot of street information then. Oh, yeah, this. absolutely. That's really helpful, I think. Oh, very much so. I came from a family where, you know, my grandmother was addicted to medications that she shouldn't have had, that she was buying illegally mm -hmm. um, in Henderson, Nevada. Everybody drank in the family. Everybody, I mean, we would get together for family things and pass the marijuana around the circle mm -hmm. and pass the prescription bottle around the circle and... You know, it was just a, it was just the way that was my father's family. My mother's family was very, very different from that. But yeah, so I wanted to see if I could understand why people would continue to use opiates, particularly, but anything, um, despite the fact they're destroying them. I was curious mm -hmm. about that. 
And I'd had my own experience with drinking and fortunately had been able to quit. So I was kind of, I was thinking, well, why can't, why couldn't they all have quit? <laughs> as a child, did you look at that opportunity um, as a rite of passage? That when I grow up, I can be part of this? Oh, sure. Uh -huh. Oh, sure, yeah. You had to be part of it uh -huh. to, to participate in the family. But how, how did you know that it was time for you to start growing up and entering into that? I knew that it was time to quit drinking because um, I was out of control. And How'd you know it was it was okay for you to participate in um, having a joint or? How did I know it was okay? Because it was all my my family was doing it, so it was okay for them. It must have been. A, you didn't ask it. You didn't were you weren't offered it. Oh yeah, we we stood in a circle and passed the joint around. But you, nobody said, "Oh, Lori, now you're old enough to." You can no, 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 it was you know. As a matter of fact, there was um, there was a refrigerator drawer in the bot. There was a, a, a crisper drawer in the bottom uh -huh. of the refrigerator, with the beers for the kids in it. Really, so we were taught to drink when we were very little. I drank beer out of them. You know those little glasses that have tulips on them. And yeah, stuff? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Welch's grape juice. Right. <laughs> yeah. That was my. So it was a delightful. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. It was a treat. It was a colorful. I like that. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, the orientation to drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. is very insidious. Oh, it is, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it, it, when it's normalized and it's part of your family culture, yeah. you just do it. You just do it. So did your uh, mother's family also engage in this? Uh, no, just no. my grandfather. Huh. My grandfather drank a lot. My mm -hmm. mother's father drank a lot, but everybody else, no. Mm -hmm. They were very concerned about my father and his family mm -hmm. and the influence, and they didn't really want us to visit. My parents were divorced when I was nine. They were very, my grandmother and my mother's mother was very upset about us going over there and drinking and stuff. She mm -hmm. knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. So, but there was always that tension between the two families. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, they were, they were both, both of the families were very much okay with us being lesbians. My sister and I were, we, we came out to each other when we were in high school. You and your sister? Right, and the family was fine with that. Uh -huh. In fact, when I, when I told my grandmother, my mother's mother, she said, Oh, well, that, oh, thank goodness. I knew something was going on, but I was afraid you were on dope. <laughs> something serious. Oh, you're just gay. Okay, that's right. fine. Right, right. Just that, that minor. <laughs> so, so then, were you aware that you were a lesbian or you were following the usual direction? Probably second grade, I uh -huh. think. Um, like a lot of people that I know and love have the similar story of mm -hmm. just being you know, a little kid knowing that. But mm -hmm. I do recall in second grade, we were being asked what we want to be when we grow up. Mm -hmm. And I said... I thought of that question. In second grade. I mean, I wonder who you invented that question. I don't know, it's weird. <laughs> what do you know? You're seven. <laughs> You're seven. <laughs> right. anyway. So I said that when I grew up, I wanted to marry Barbara Stanwyck. Mm. That's what I wanted to do. And um, it was her voice. The teacher was... There was a show called The voice. Big Valley. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. And she wore a black Stetson hat mm -hmm. and she had black boots and she was the matriarch of the family she rode a horse like she could just hop on a horse and go <laughs> and she she could use a what she could use a rifle and a, a, a rope and, and like she told the men what to do basically she mm -hmm. ran the ranch mm -hmm. and i remember feeling like oh my gosh i love her i want i want to mm -hmm. be with her i want mm -hmm. to be like her i want to you know that was who i wanted to connect to mm -hmm. And um, the school, the school teacher, I remember the second grade teacher was like a little taken aback and actually called my mom and let her know, you know, your daughter said this. And my mom said, the teacher told me that you said you wanted to marry Barbara Stomach. And, <laughs> I'm concerned. And that's okay. And she said, that's okay. <laughs> you can marry whoever you want. Mm -hmm. that Which was, was nice. amazing. Yeah. Right? That, that was really opened the door. Oh, my mom was amazing with that. Uh -huh. Yeah. She... Uh -huh. She told me when I was seven, you can marry whoever you want. I don't know if she knew what she was really right. saying. <laughs> you did. I knew what she you took saying. it for what you wanted. Okay, Barbara Stanwyck. That was it. Have you ever met her? I never met her, no. Mm -hmm. I wish I might have had that chance. Mm -hmm. I've met a lot of people in show business but not her. Yeah. I, th I don't know if she was still alive and working when I came here. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she was an amazing actor. Mm -hmm. So then you... You and your sister came out to each other at the we same did. time? We did, yeah. Did you have any inkling there might be a similar persuasion? No, not too much. I was a little jealous because she was in the 10th grade, I was in the 12th grade, and she already had a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So I was jealous about that. Yeah. 
and her girlfriend was this amazing, wild, crazy woman who <laughs> tenth grader. Uh-huh. Who, um, <laughs> I mean, we used to cruise around in my sister's um, Ford Mustang convertible with, you know, cigarettes, mm-hmm. and the three of us, and trying to figure out how do we be this, you know, how do we be this thing that we are, whatever we are. I don't know. We didn't really mm-hmm. have. A, you didn't have a name for it, or did you? We knew that it was. We knew that Les. Well, see, my there was there was a bar in Vegas where all the women went. And we knew about that. Um, by virtue of mythology, local mythology. Mm-hmm. By the time we actually went to that bar, we were probably a little bit older, probably 18 and 20 or something like that. Um, the owner of the bar was the... Oh, what was the name of it? It was called Maxine's. Uh-huh. And, we're, do- we're documenting history now. We're documenting history. Right. So <laughs> Maxine's in Las Vegas was out on, um, it was out on the highway. It was uh-huh. way out of town. People would park their cars behind the bar and Maxine had it set up so you could park back there and not be seen. And fortunately for us, Maxine was a relative of the county sheriff. <laughs> fortunate for Maxine too, probably. Right. right. <laughs> they had a deal that she would not disclose their relationship. He was mm-hmm. her brother. Mm-hmm. She would not disclose mm-hmm. his, their relationship and he would protect the bar and the women in the bar. Huh. So whenever men came in the bar to bother us, which happened now and then, mm-hmm. uh, probably regularly. Um, she would just make a phone call, and the sheriffs would show up and get rid of the guy. So we never had trouble there. That's great. Huh? It was amazing. I remember that here, where I went to the bars, the cops would come in just to hassle. Oh yeah, they would just they look at the women. Oh, sure, yeah, right. absolutely. You big flurry, and then they disappear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they don't want to do anything. Right. So we were very, very fortunate. Yeah, that's nice. good. Yeah. So then how'd you get to California, to Los Angeles? We um, we were both in the theater department at UNLV, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. We were in the theater there. And um, we we met friends there who were a little older than us, who were who were also a gay, it was a gay guy, Noel, and, and, a, and a friend, a female friend who was lesbian. They were older than us, and they said, we got to take you to this parade. This is you and your sister? Yeah. Uh-huh. we got to take you guys to West Hollywood, to this parade. <laughs> right. So we traveled up from Vegas to West Hollywood to the parade, 76, I think it was. Uh-huh. Um, by then, it was a pretty decent parade, and it was on Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. It started out on Hollywood Boulevard. Then right. Uh, by the time we got to it in 76, it was on, it was on Santa Monica. Santa Monica. And we came up to the parade and, you know, they, they were telling us all the time in Vegas, there's a lot of us, there's a lot of us, you know, like it's a <laughs> big see. group. It's yeah, not just you'll be surprised. <laughs> not just four. <laughs> so we came and we're ju- I remember standing on the boulevard just sobbing, just, you know. To see so many people. People. Huh. Scientists, teachers groups, scientist groups, church groups, temp- you know, uh, Jewish community groups. Um, of course, all the drag queens and the floats and the music and all that stuff. The dikes on bikes. The bikes were, oh, come on. <laughs> I was impressed with that. Oh, yeah. So at that point, we realized, oh, my gosh, we have to go to, Cal- we, we have mm-hmm. to, go to California. Mm-hmm. It took a little while to get here. It took probably four or five more years for us to get ourselves here, but mm-hmm. we did. We ended up saying, okay, no, this is where our people live. I went to work right away for a theater promoter, um, Bill Graham, who's very famous. Um, I worked for him at the Wiltern Theater for... That's I remember first. you worked at the Wiltern Theater. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So that was my first job in L.A. Uh-huh. Actually, my first job was cashiering at a place in West Hollywood for on the graveyard shift where I met a whole bunch of people who would come in there over the overnight shift. Um, people that were like big celebrities and stuff would come in there with their part, like female partners. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it was just, it was just amazing to me to see the level of success that lesbian people could achieve in show business and in LA. I mean, it was just, it was just quite inspiring. Has um, being a lesbian or knowing people know that you're a lesbian ever been difficult for you professionally or? Um, it was difficult when we, when my partner Jane and I moved to Burbank with the two little kids. Mm-hmm. Burbank was a very conservative place. Um, 
And so we, I think we were one of the first open women couples to come mm -hmm. in with little kids into that school district. Uh -huh. um, and we weren't that welcome. We had to win people over. Uh -huh. But um, Jane definitely won people over. Like there was nobody that could resist her sincerity and genuineness. And so she did, she won people over. Mm -hmm. The first people that we met in Burbank were a couple who were both actors. Um, they're both little people. And um, they said to us, look, here's how we've managed Burbank. Just be yourself and be kind and eventually you'll win them over. Mm -hmm. That's true where we were. Oh, right? Yeah. And so they became our close friends. Oh. And, uh, we spent quite a bit of time with them. Yeah. And they taught us how to be different, mm -hmm. basically. And be okay. In be a place safe. like that. Yeah. yeah, in a place like that. But, but, but until then, I had not felt... Um, in L.A., I didn't. In Vegas, yes, we were definitely threatened. Um, we had people who would drive by the bars with guns and shoot them off and throw things at us really? and throw rocks, bottles. Um, yeah, there were some threatening situations uh -huh. in the 70s back there. You felt directed at you? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. oh, definitely. Really? Wow. I have had a gun pointed in my face, you know, by threatening people and, yeah. That was Las Vegas in the 70s. It is mm -hmm. not the case now. Now it is like fabulous gay Vegas. But <laughs> right at that time. Oh, it was. But at that time, nothing was fabulous gay anywhere, I don't think. Probably I mean, not. Unless Los were, Angeles, because there were a lot of us. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or maybe like, I've heard people talk about places like Fire Island or Provincetown, mm -hmm. P-Town or someplace like that. But not in the West. No, it was. We went to Provincetown. Did you? Mm -hmm. Because we had a child. And I heard that Rosie O'Donnell was having this thing down there. So we went down there and it was for families. Oh yeah. There was a moment when we walked down the street at the end of the weekend, so to speak. I felt the whole world was gay. Yeah. It was a wonderful oh, experience. Yeah. Never have had it again or since or you know, I mean it's very liberating. But just the the masses of, and the families connected mm -hmm. was really a good experience for me. Yeah. Beautiful. How long were you and Jane together? Fifteen years. Uh, Fifteen years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not too, not enough, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, I was telling Kelly that I remembered when you connected. Yes, and I we never connected. saw that happen except with my own experience. Like, yeah, but I never saw another couple <laughs> yeah. in a moment <laughs> making that connection. Yeah, it was yeah. great. I mean, it was. I thought, whoa. It was great. There it is. Right. I was kind of mad about it for a while because she was married at the time to a man, to her husband, mm -hmm. the kid's dad. And I was kind of, I mean, in that moment, it was overwhelming. I mean, it was amazingly intense fireworks going off. I knew exactly what was going on, but I wasn't mm -hmm. that excited about it because she was... You were scared. Probably. I was scared. I was terrified. Yeah. I was terrified mm -hmm. because... One of the things that I had sworn up and down to my girl friends was, I will not get involved with a straight girl. You know, that was just not something you did. You know, don't get involved with a straight girl. They'll just break your heart. They're only looking for entertainment. Wow, but she wasn't straight. I know. <laughs> and she really been straight. It wouldn't work. <laughs> That's right. right. I, I eventually came to understand that right. pretty quickly. Uh -huh, good. But it was at the beginning. It was mm -hmm. scary. Yeah, I can understand that. And she was pregnant, so, mm -hmm. and she had a, a year and a half old, mm -hmm. so it was a lot, a, a lot to take in. I had not imagined myself with little kids until that point, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the little kids were um, a big surprise, a wonderful gift, but mm -hmm. still not, not something I was looking for mm -hmm. in the world. You know? I understand that. I'm a dog person, so. <laughs> right. If it would have been puppies, okay. Right. How many dogs do you have now? I have three now. Uh huh. Yeah, I have three. And now you're in a committed relationship again. I'm married again. You're married. Yeah, we're yeah. legally married. We got married in 2014. Uh huh. My current wife, Susan, is a um, an activist in the Episcopal Church. She's mm -hmm. a priest in the Episcopal Church, but her whole focus over the last 25 years has been um, LGBT. Q plus inclusion and um, and uh, parity, I think, in the church. So, but she's also like she's also worked a lot with Planned Parenthood, with 
um, a lot of the human rights campaign. Mm -hmm. She was really big on the uh, Prop 8 work and interfaith work. So, yeah, she's an activist. We met at doing that work, actually, the Prop 8 organizing, pretty mm -hmm. much. Really? Yeah. That's appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> Going in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, that was very important. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. So, we were friends for a long time doing that political activism and uh -huh. working in the church because. I went back to the church in 1999 um, because Jane was very much, uh, she had grown up in the Roman Catholic Church and mm -hmm. really missed it, like mm -hmm. really, really, really missed it. So we found this church in Pasadena that was very affirming. Mm -hmm. And I told her I was not going to go to the church. I'm not going <laughs> back to the church, forget about it, right? Um, but the minute we walked in there, it was very affirming and very familiar. So we what said, church is it? it's All Saints Pasadena. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's where we ended up staying. I'm still, I still, I'm a member there. Uh -huh. And, um, Susan, my wife now is, is on the staff there. She's been for 20 years. Did she years. meet Jane? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. She presided at Jane's funeral, actually. Wow. Yeah. She's, she, and, and her partner was also a friend of mine too, Louise. Mm -hmm. Louise died of cancer, um, not that long after Jane had wow. died. So we became, as friends, we were uh -huh. consoling each other, essentially. Yeah. Um, and comparing notes and trying to figure out. And then we realized, wow, we've always been kind of attracted to each other. But we were married to these other people that we right. adored. Right. Right. So you have those attractions that you just sort of, eh, whatever. Um, you put to the back of your mind. But then all of a sudden it started to make sense that we were connecting again. Mm -hmm. You know. So, yeah, we've had, we have a really good life together. I'm glad. I'm looking forward to meeting her. So your sexuality is... Um, just sort of evolved as you've evolved, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. you know, Definitely. Comfortability with it. And, or having a gun pointed at you. Why did you have a gun pointed at you? Well, I was having a, an affair with a young woman who, whose family was Mormon. They were very much against her being a lesbian. Mm -hmm. And she was still seeing me anyway. Mm -hmm. And... She, and she asked me to come and pick her up because her father was harassing her. She said, "Come, please come and pick me up at the house. So I made the mistake of going to their house. And her father opened the door and pointed the gun out the mm -hmm. door at me and said, you know, if you don't get out of here, if you ever come near my daughter again, I'm going to kill you and God will thank me mm -hmm. and no one will ever see you again. That's, that is so scary. And he thinks like that. He thinks, he, right. you know. They don't so, make that up. This is their No, thought. this was his thinking. Mm -hmm. So what did you do? I called her and I said, I can't, I can't do this. I'm uh -huh. terrified of him. Yeah. Are you Your dad's serious. She said, please help me, please, please, yeah. please, please. Mm -hmm. And I said, I really can't. You need to go back to school. She was going to BYU. She was just home for the summer. Mm -hmm. I said, you need to go back to BYU. So where do you see your life going now? Now I'm hoping to, um, to spend the next Three, I'm hoping three more years working in, in L.A. in uh, social work. It's really rigorous. Yeah. It's really demanding. Um, and the people that I'm working with are really, really ill. So it's, it's mm -hmm. very, um, it's a great big challenge. So I think in the next year, I'm probably going to transition into a little bit easier type of work, mm -hmm. stay in social work. It's definitely going to be there. All this PTSD oh, stuff. It's okay. just the time to be in. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you advise people... Um, who have lost their partners as to how to get through it. It's important to connect to the relationship that you had and to, to confer, affirm for yourself that love doesn't die. Mm -hmm. Love just never dies. I mean, it's, it's hard to hold on to that when you're in the midst of, of that kind of loss mm -hmm. because it's devastating so you you know for me it was devastating but the fact that love never dies just holding on to that and kind of trying mm -hmm. to keep your heart connected to that other person so if you knew that your life was ending soon what would you like to be remembered for for um being able to walk with folks that are really struggling and in pain and not shy away from that. To be able to walk the journey with other people mm -hmm. who are, um, who have not been blessed 
and fortunate in the way that I have, just to be able to walk with them and not shy away from their pain and their loss. And just to be fully present with other people. I would like for people to say, Lori was able to be really fully present with others, even when it was really painful. Uh -huh. yeah. Even when it was really not easy. So, Because I think that's that's what it's about here in this realm, is the connection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a word that you used the other day. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but the connection, however many connections we can make, mm -hmm. we're all in one large web of life. And those connections are what keeps us all alive and moving forward. So I would say just being able to connect even when it's painful. That's good. You know, it's I ask this question of everyone that I heard you. You know, most everyone says the same thing. Really? Yeah. That's and great. I, in one way or another, kindness. They'd like to be remembered for being kind. Connection. Yeah. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting for me to see you, and it's good for me to see you, and thank you for being here. Oh, it's been so great. Yeah. I hope to see you soon again. You will. All right. I have no doubt about that. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you.